Okay, good morning everyone for, on the last day. Uh, my name is Mahindra, here everybody knows, but uh, uh, the speaker probably won't know. So, uh, we are, it's a pleasure to have uh, the last talk by Professor Yoran Oz. Uh, he will talk about unraveling turbulence, field theory, gravity, and deep learning. So it has everything about the theme of the topic which, of the conference, which is great. Okay, uh, Yoran, please continue. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can hear you well. Okay, so uh, first I apologize for not being with you. I'm sure it has been a wonderful event. Uh, what I would like to talk about are three directions uh, to turbulence. One is field theory, one is gravity, and one is deep learning. And perhaps try to convince you that these are fruitful directions uh, to pursue. Uh, the outline is as follows. I will first briefly discuss the problem of turbulence. By now, I'm sure everybody knows it. What is the story of the anomalous scaling? Then I will propose a field theory of turbulence at the inertial range of scales with a precise formula for the anomalous scaling exponents. I will say a little bit about why gravity plays an important role here and where it will play even more important role probably in the future. And then if time permits, I will tell you how deep learning can actually help us understand turbulence and some challenges. So turbulence is a very old problem. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci in these famous drawings was trying to depict how turbulence looks in the Arno River. And, uh, oops. What happens now? Uh, seems like I cannot go down. Okay. Uh, and the turbulence itself is just a Latin, turba is a Latin word for crowd, and turbulence typically refers to some disorderly motion of a crowd. Scientifically, it refers to a complex and unpredictable motion of a fluid. That's the context where we are studying it. And turbulence is a major unsolved problem of physics, even though it actually comes from very simple laws, Newton's second law, but because of the large number of interacting degrees of freedom, uh, what you see is a very, a very complex structure that is emergent. Now, what is interesting is that environmentally in our universe, all, uh, all most of the fluid motions are uh, in fact turbulent. So there is a lot of uh, experimental uh, evidence around us. The question is why? Why in our universe it's like that? And in fact, despite centuries of research, we still don't have a good understanding of the nonlinear regime of turbulence, an analytical one. And all the tricks of uh, knowing the equations, etc., is not sufficient, is not effective. You need something else. And uh, we believe that inside to turbulence, they are not only going to help us understand turbulence, but they are key to understanding nonlinear systems that have large number of strongly degrees of freedom, which are also far from equilibrium. In particular, there is the question of the probability measure that replaces the Gibbs one. So, so I'm going to consider uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, which are the equations that govern fluid motions at velocities smaller, smaller than the speed of sound. And uh, so we'll discuss incompressible fluid turbulence. And the equations are just Newton's law for fluid elements. You know them very well. So there is an evolution equation for the velocity vector field. There is the force of the pressure. There is a viscous term. And you can add also a forcing uh, scale. Uh, and the fluid is uh, incompressible. So the divergence is zero. Uh, in particular, not all the degrees of freedom are independent. The, the pressure and the velocity are actually related by a constraint equation. There is an important dimensionless parameter in the problem called the Reynolds number, and it's basically the dimensionless ratio, which comes from uh, taking the characteristic scale, length scale in the problem, the velocity difference at that scale divided by uh, the kinematic viscosity. And what it does, it compares the nonlinear term and the viscous term. So if it's large, you get a complex uh, motion. If it's small, you get a laminar motion. And typically what we know numerically and also experimentally is that if the Reynolds number is order 1000 or more, one observes turbulent structure, which I'm going to discuss what is turbulent structure. By this, I mean some kind of anomalous scaling. 
And it's an interesting thing that this is a phenological observation, which is rather general, is not, it doesn't depend on the particular type of fluid or whether it's air, etc., etc. And this is actually from Wikipedia, the experiment by Reynolds, where he took a, a tube and injected dye, and he saw that as he increases the velocity, he gets to the turbulent regime. So now why in our nature everything is typically turbulent? The reason is because of the kinematic viscosity, which is very small. The kinematic viscosity of water is 10 to the minus six meters squared by second. The one of air is 1.5 times 10 to the minus five meters squared by second. So an average river will have a Reynolds number of 10 to the seven. In general, whatever we do will generate turbulence because this quantity is in the denominator. The reason why it's smaller for water compared to air is because you divide by the density. So turbulent velocity field has a very complex structure, both spatial and temporal. And even though Navier-Stokes equations are deterministic if you don't end the random force, if you just try, you're interested in one single realization, it's pretty much unpredictable. So instead of that, people thought about studying uh, statistics of solutions, namely basically the understanding the space of solutions of Navier-Stokes equations and averaging over them. And now what happened is that numerical experimental data shows that if you look at these statistical averages, they have some kind of a universal structure which is shared by all the turbulent flows, independent of the details of the flow. So one defines the inertial range, which is the range of scales which are bigger, bigger than the viscous scale and smaller, smaller than the, uh, the large scale of the problem, uh, the forcing scale. And uh, in, that, in that range, it seems the turbulence uh, reaches a steady state that exhibits statistical homogeneity and isotopy. This has never been proven mathematically directly from Navier-Stokes equations, but it is expected or believed to be a correct statement. So we are going to assume that as well. So you need to define observables that you are going to calculate their averages. One very famous observable is a velocity difference. You take the velocity of the fluid at different points. And, uh, and uh, what you do is uh, you calculate uh, differences between the velocities at two points, and then you dot it with the vector uh, separating them. Uh, that This is called longitudinal. You can also dot it by the transverse vector. This will be called transverse. And these are good observables, and you can calculate their expectation values by averaging over a space of solutions, average over initial conditions, et cetera, et cetera. In principle, we expect that all of these types of averages give you the same thing. And what people observed is that these, uh, these are called structure functions. They scale uh, like uh, R, that's because of homogeneity and isotropy, but with certain numbers, this Xi n, and these numbers are similar to the anomalous scaling exponents we see in quantum field theory. They are universal numbers, dimensionless numbers, and they are independent of the details of the problem. The coefficients, the overall coefficients are not universal. They can depend on the particular problem at hand. So the question is, if you have this set, this by the way set of numbers, that, uh, they do depend on the number of space dimensions. So it's the same, it's not the same number in numbers in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, etc. And the question is for us, the task is, can we calculate these numbers from some theory? Okay. So Kolmogorov uh, actually made probably the most important contribution in this field in 1941. He used this idea of uh, Richardson of a cascade, basically the idea that uh, fluid turbulence is such that there is a large eddy which starts to break due to instabilities to smaller and smaller eddies. And in the inertial range of scales, uh, basically, let's say between some scale here and here, what happens is that the flux the, the assumption is that the flux is constant, and that's what we call mean field theory or dimensional analysis, etc. And in Kolmogorov language, what he assumes is that the probability distribution functions for these velocity differences 
has some scale invariant statistics. So it's a function of this observable divided by R to the H, where H a number. And then he fixed this H. Uh, and what happens is that you get was famous Kolmogorov linear scaling. It's what we call dimensional analysis in field theory or mean field theory, etc. And so if you look, for instance, at the, at the if you look at the structure functions, they will scale like R to the power N over three. And uh, in particular, if you take N equal to two and you Fourier transform, this is we call the energy power spectrum, you will have this famous Kolmogorov scaling. And it's actually pretty, it was pretty good and it's pretty good also now, but we do know that this is actually incorrect. It's uh, in fact, it's already known that all direct cascades is the cascades I was talking about. They are, no, they, are numer they are known numerically and experimentally to break the scale invariance. They don't have Kolmogorov scaling. There is a particular case in two space dimensions because in two space dimensions, you have uh, two positive definite invariant quantities, the entropy and the energy. So there are two different cascades. And the energy cascades in fact goings in the opposite directions from the UV to the IR instead of from the IR to the UV. In that case, it seems like maybe Kolmogorov scaling is correct. Now we also know what, what was actually incorrect in the assumptions of Kolmogorov. He assumed self-similarity, the scaling invariance, and direct cascades break it. And the, the, the thing that breaks it is called intermittency. So what is intermittency? So this is a schematic picture of the Cantor function. What happens is that if you have a scale invariant function or, or self-similar, if I zoom in, in, in the UV in different places, I'm going to see the same structure. This is called the, the devil's staircase. And if you zoom here, you're gonna see something else than if you zoom here. So it means that uh, uh, the velocity vector field, what it does, if you look at it, it's just, it can be a calm regions and then some kind of an abrupt ch changes, et cetera, et cetera. It's not self-similar. It's not described by one exponent, that H that Kolmogorov used. And in general, schematically, what is known about the anomalous scalings is that uh, if you look at, uh, at the anomalous scalings as a function of N, uh, there is the Kolmogorov line N over three, uh, then there is uh, the schematic plot of how the exponents look, the anomalous exponents look. At n equal to three, they agree because analytically you can derive it to be one. This, what I plotted here is Burger's turbulence is the one dimensional uh, exponents. It's, uh, it's a very partic particular case. It's not incompressible. And there's a conjecture uh, due to Grisha Falkovic in a paper with me and, and uh, Itzhak Fuxon, which actually at large D, Navier Stokes will give you one, and there is some evidence for that. Now I'm going to propose an, an, an answer to the problem, and uh, I'm going to propose the following formula for an, from field theory for the, all these exponents. And the formula is what you see here. The exponents is, if you want to exponent in an arbitrary number of dimensions, bigger or equal to two, uh, what you're supposed to do is solve this quadratic equation. And let me explain you a little bit about this quadratic equation. This is the intermittency parameter. It's a dimensionless parameter that depend on number of space dimensions. If you set it to zero, you will just get Kolmogorov scaling. Otherwise you will get some, some results. And uh, I will explain this formula where it comes from, but those of you who, who know two-dimensional quantum gravity, they can recognize this as KPZ scaling when you take a conformal field theory, couple it to quantum gravity, how the exponents are changing. This will be actually very similar to the philosophy where we are going to talk about. That's how sort of gravity inspires us uh, for this uh, formula. Uh, so what happens is that the right-hand side basically tells you what's the deviation from Kolmogorov scaling. So this is the intermittency. If there is no intermittency, it will be zero. Uh, otherwise, there will be some numbers and we develop this in a, we first we recognize this formula uh, just phenomenologically, then I uh, will show you some explanation where it comes from. Okay, so first let's just check briefly how it compares with experiment. In two space dimensions, I told you that the inverse cascade seems to show that uh, uh, that uh, Kolmogorov scaling works. It means that this parameter is zero and therefore you're just gonna get Kolmogorov scaling. So it's, uh, it's easy. 
If you go to three space dimensions, there are a couple of results that I'm going to show. There are even more, more modern results by the group of uh, Luca Biferal, etc. They all work as well. So I just try to fit, uh, if I try to fit the formula to, to known results, you will get, uh, for instance, in three dimensions, something like about 0 0.16 for this parameter. And uh, uh, by the way, the errors, the error bars are pretty large here. And also, as you can see, you don't you don't know so, so many so many moments. So in fact, I can fit it in with with many other functions as people did. Uh, this is also the numerical results that people did for for three space dimensions. You'll get roughly the same same numbers within the error bars. There is actually a tour de force work by Goto who did it in also in four dimensions. So you can also calculate this quantity in four dimensions. It seems that it's more intermittent. Now, this formula is actually a curious formula because in 1962, in fact, after Kolmogorov uh, wrote his, his, his paper, actually there was a conference in Kazan, and I think that uh, Landau was arguing that actually the quantity that he thought is, or he proposed is constant is actually is a random variable. Therefore, it, it, the assumptions were, pretty, were wrong. And then they changed the formula, Kolmogorov and Obuchov, to another one, which is called Kolmogorov-Obuchov formula. It's, uh, if you see, it looks pretty similar to what I said, except that here, these are not psi n's, these are n's. This formula is actually the leading order in the expansion of the formula that I was giving for small intermittency. This one is inconsistent in the sense that it has suffers all kinds of mathematical uh, problems, uh, as well as you can see at large n, it doesn't really work, but it is an approximation at small intermittency of the formula that I was I was giving. The one that I showed you is actually consistent. It doesn't have any uh, issues with the convexity inequalities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and it has an interesting behavior. It scales, the exponent scales at large n is square root of n. Typically, most of the things that people propose phenomenologically, they will scale like n. Uh, this one scale like square root of n. Now, where does this come from? So first of all, let me remind you the mathematics behind this formula, and then I'll tell you how it's, connect, how it's connected to the physics of Navier-Stokes. So there is the following mathematical question. Suppose I give you a set of dimensions with respect to some measure d mu, where d mu is just Euclidean measure. And then I'm asking you, okay, but I'm giving you now a new measure, we call it a random measure. And that random measure is e to the gamma phi of x. Gamma is a number and phi is a low correlated uh, Gaussian uh, field. Then I can ask you, give me the same numbers, but with respect, the same, translate the numbers with respect to d mu to the numbers with respect to d mu gamma. In the language of, of the conformal field theory of the late 80s, the question was, I give you a conformal field theory with certain scaling dimensions, I couple it to random geometry, tell me how the dimensions change. This used to be called solving quantum gravity because quantum gravity in two dimensions is just about random geometries. There's nothing more than that. And the formula that does it is the KPZ formula. And that was discussed in two dimensions, but in fact, it's a, a general mathematical statement. If I will change phi of x, and I will tell you that it's not a Gaussian free field, but some other distribution, you're just going to get a new formula, another one, and you can derive it. Now, there is no random geometry in, in, in turbulence, right? So where does it come from? And where do you get random geometry, et cetera, et cetera? So here, I want to show you first an observation. An observation of where Kolmogorov scaling came from, from the field theory point of view. If you look at the Navier-Stokes equations in the infinite limit without viscosity, it's well known that it has two different scale symmetries. X goes to e to the sigma, t, sigma x, sigma is a free parameter, and t goes to the e to the z sigma t, z, and other, z is another free parameter. So it's different scaling of space and time, and it's a well-known result. You can just check the equation, it has these symmetries. If you look at the flux, the local energy dissipation or the flux, the expectation values of this quantity breaks this symmetry. And it breaks it to particular dynamical exponent z equal to two thirds. If you check this, you will see that this is exactly Kolmogorov scaling. 
Now, what, what does this buy us? It means from field theory point of view that I should view Kolmogorov scaling as a spontaneous symmetry breaking of this space symmetry, space scale symmetries. But from field theory, we know that if you spontaneously break a symmetry, what happens is there should be a Goldstone boson. So where is this Goldstone boson? So how do I find the Goldstone boson? I parameterize the quantity that was breaking the symmetry as the its expectation values times e to the tau, tau is the Goldstone boson, delta is some parameter. And now I can ask, what is the action of this Goldstone boson? Now I can use symmetries and the fact that I'm in the inertial range of scales and cut uh, derivative expansions. And actually I can come up with the action. It's the analog of the Coulomb gas in two dimensions. So I will, I will tell you in a second all these objects, but it has quadratic term and also a term pop up with the background charge. So the way I'm going to view turbulence in the inertial range is some mean field theory, let's call it Kolmogorov theory, and then it's coupled to this, to this dilaton. And now I'm going to use this, free, this theory in order to calculate the exponents. Now, those of you who know uh, the solutions to dimensional quantum gravity, they will recognize that I'm doing something very similar. The Kolmogorov mean field theory is like the conformal field theory, and the gravity is this dilaton. So now if I do that, uh, so first of all, just to let me, you know about the, the, this, what is this? This is known to the, in, the, in the conformal field theory community as the GJMS operator. It's a conformally covariant operator. This is called Q curvature. It's a conformally invariant quantity uh, in two dimensions. This is just Laplacian, and this is uh, just going to be the uh, Riemann, Riemann scalar. In general, we can write these formulas. Uh, and in fact, in if you, if you want to solve the problem, not in D dimensions, but three space dimensions, this becomes a pseudo differential operator. There are all kinds of details, but these de details don't matter very much for me. We can write the operators, et cetera, et cetera. I can just follow my nose and solve the problem as is done in two dimensional quantum gravity. And the way it's done is that all the observables of the theory are the observables of the K41 theory dressed with this dilaton field. That's the way you are writing the, the, the operators in the theory. And there are a couple of steps that I'm going to, 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 to skip now. You can easily derive this formula 20. 20 says that if you know the dimension under K40, K41 scaling of the object, you know the real dimension, this is the quantity. This gamma will be related to this calligraphic G, what we call the, the intermittency parameter. So what did I assume here in this all this derivation? I assumed, first of all, that there is a steady state so, and that there is also scaling. Second, I assume that this dilaton couples to this Kolmogorov uh, 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 mean field theory in a way that it's particularly written here. And if you assume that, then you will follow your nose, you will get this answer. So if I go back to the structure functions, uh, so these were the observables, right? Uh, delta RV were the velocity differences dotted with this uh, vector. And because I know that data, the, the Kolmogorov dimension is N over three, I just plug it in this formula. This is the formula I showed you before. And as I showed you, this formula till now still works co uh, correctly with the experimental and numerical data. But I think that uh, once we make a little bit better progress, we will see whether it's correct or not, because it will be very different from other like Schellevec formulas, et cetera, starting from 10, 12, 14, you will start to see deviations. So you will know which one of them is, is actually correct. The intermittency parameter, it's easy to show that it's actually related to this background charge of this uh, field, uh, the Dilaton field that I was telling you about. And you can ask me, okay, can you calculate it from first principles? Because in all the analysis that I did so far, I actually fit it, for instance, for, for, this, for using the second moment. And then after that, I derive for you all the others. But I needed to fit to one number. Can I derive this formula, this number from first principles? for arbitrary number of space dimensions, because actually by the way, number of dimensions here doesn't matter. It's the same formula for everything, for everyone. And uh, I remind you that in two dimensional quantum gravity, the trick was to, to claim that the central charges of the, 
now okay now i'm talking to the experts i'm sorry but the 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 central charges of the cft and of the leo will cancel each other you know f- to assure uh, conformal invariance which was needed for string theory but here where will i get a formula like that but i remind you that actually there is this infrared scale l and i don't want that infrared scale l to affect my universality numbers, my universal numbers. So what I, I can ask is I can require that if the theory has some kind of a partition function, when I derive it with respect to this L or log L, I should get zero. So it will be independent of L. This gives a relation between the A-type anomaly, conformal anomalies of uh, this dilaton and the, four, the K41 theory and derives a formula like that. Where is the question? The question is, okay, how do we know what is the Euler and Euler type anomaly, conformal anomaly of, of Kolmogorov theory? I don't know what's the theory. It's a non-local theory. I know some things about its anomalous dimensions, but that's it. I can try you about several attempts that I made. I don't know how to calculate AK41 until now. If somebody finds it, then he can check whether this fits the experimental data or not in general. Okay, um, so let me summarize this. Intermittency in this model is explained as introducing a random measure due to the local energy dissipation. And you can derive a precise formula, by, by the way, not only for this, for all other observables. This formula doesn't hold only for this particular observable. It's just that there are not so many, so, so much numerical evidence for, for other ones. Okay, so let me, uh, stop at this point on this and let me tell you why gravity is important. So Einstein's equations are, are, uh, are of course not dissipative, but black holes, once you use them, they will break time reversal invariant symmetry and they allow dissipative effects. And the important for, point for me in this, uh, actually is starting with the work of Damour and then uh, the, the work by uh, Minuala, Rangamani, and others here, uh, was that actually if you look at the uh, Einstein's equations, or if you perturb a black hole and you look at the Einstein's equations projected on the horizon, and if you normalize, if you parameterize the deviation from the equilibrium by the pressure and the normal by the velocity, the equations for black holes uh, horizon are just another Stokes equations. That was for me the original reason why to f- search for random geometry, because of that you can map every solutions of, of another Stokes equations to some kind of a random geometry. So there is a lot of things to be learned from this direction, I, I'm sure, but it deserves uh, another time. Maybe Amos told you a little bit about it, I, uh, but that will be the part of uh, g- uh, gravity that I'm going to uh, to discuss uh, this uh, short uh, this short talk. And then let me use a few minutes to tell you about deep learning. So why deep learning can help us? <clears throat> so I will tell you about three directions. One is can can machines learn to follow the solutions of the Navier Stokes equations? What by what I mean by this is I will teach it by giving it several solutions for different initial conditions. And then I will give it different initial condition and ask it me to give me the solution. So this is one thing that we tried. We said, okay, let's look at, not, we are by the way, not the only ones. There's a lot of, lot of people doing these things, trying to do these things. Uh, I will tell you what we added. Uh, so we basically look at the evolution equation of a velocity vector field. And uh, this is some kind of a nonlinear stuff. Doesn't have to be Navier Stokes, could be Burger's equation, some other equation, et cetera. And what we did, we gave it two pick two plots of the solutions, because the vector field is just a plot. I mean, it's just uh, some picture. So we gave it the pictures at the initial time and the pictures at the time t, some fixed t. And then what we asked her by consistency conditions, et cetera, to give her and to give the machine another initial condition and ask it to develop the whole solution up to T. Not just give me the T, but the whole solution up to T. There are, there are ways to do that with all kinds of consistency conditions. It was doing pretty okay. So there are all kinds of pictures that I can show you. These are from Burger's turbulence, two-dimensional Burger's turbulence, but, uh, and it developed the shocks, et cetera, et cetera. 
There is a question though, a very, very important question in this business. Because of the fact that at some point uh, uh, the trajectories are going to deviate exponentially, will it be able to cope up with this and learn these things? Or it actually will miss it. It will only give you things up to the turbulent regime and then afterwards it's just, it's just going to get totally lost. And it's an interesting question with, to which we do not really know completely the answer. Uh, there is a second question, which we also don't know the answer to, is that if I give it a solutions, which are solutions, let's say, on a lettuce with a size A, and then I ask it to complete it to solutions at A over a smaller, smaller grids, like A over 2, etc., etc., will it be able to capture it? This is an RG property. It's also an open question. Um, the second uh, thing which we did, we tried to understand whether machine thinks the turbulence is complex or not. Uh, what, I, what do I mean by complex or not? For instance, I suppose I give it a chaotic system and turbulent system. What I mean by this is I, I start Navier Stokes and I evolve it. And before I reach turbulence, I still have a structure which is complicated, like chaotic structure. It's not doesn't have scaling properties. Will it be able to distinguish the two? Is it easy for it compared, say, to cats and dogs? And uh, if it's easy or difficult, I don't know. Uh, at what scales was it looking? Short scales, small small scales of of this picture, etc. Uh, and what actually the observable that it was using in order to, to do that? So that was uh, the question we were asking. I'll tell you the upshot of this. Uh, by the way, these are, these are, we, we, did comp uh, we did incompressible fluid, compressible fluid. We did all kinds of chaotic things and, and uh, other stuff. The technology is very standard of convolutional neural networks. Nothing new about that. The upshot is the following, that actually uh, for machines to understand, to differentiate between cats and dogs is much more complicated than to the, the differentiate between chaos and turbulence. And we also identified that it was, which, which, which thing it was using, it was using basically the two-point function. Uh, and the reason, the way we found it is we cheated it, we gave it a noise, which has exactly the two-point function of turbulence, and it thought that it's turbulence. Okay, so this is it. Uh, and the last uh, thing that I want to tell you is, is the following. So actually, when I was asking my friends who do numerics, how difficult it is for them to give the, you know, the 12, 14, hundreds moment, they, they thought, they say it's pretty difficult. Namely, we cannot really get to the area of precision turbulence so easily with the computer power we are using. But the whole power of deep learning is to learn a distribution. So the question was, if I give it, for instance, plots, uh, some pictures of turbulence, 1,000 of them, will it be able to generate for me new, new pictures of turbulence? Now you say, how will I know that it will produce for me new pictures of turbulence? First, I can check that it's new compared to the old ones. There is a way to compare it. I'll show you in a second. But second, how do I know that it's turbulence? I check the scaling exponents. And that was the question. And so what we did is we used this, something called diffusion generative models. It's actually a very cute trick based on the diffusion equation. What you do is you take, a, you take a, a picture of turbulence, let's say, or a face of somebody, it doesn't matter. And then uh, you start to add noise. So this, all these steps forward, are Markov, Markov steps where each time I add uh, some, uh, some Gaussian noise. When I get to this point, you cannot recognize the picture anymore. It's just noise. And then I teach the system to go back. Why is this is good? Because, because I taught her to go back, now I can take another, another, another instance from the distribution of Gaussian statistics, something else. It will produce for me another picture. And this was done, you know, this is done, for instance, to produce faces, etc. what you see in the internet. But can it actually work for turbulence? Can I teach it to uh, on, on several instances of turbulence? And then I will give uh, and ask, ask to give me a new solution. 
So amazingly, it works. Um, so first of all, these are like plots that you can see from, these are real pictures, solutions of Navier-Stokes equations. And this is the ones that it produced. If you will look at it uh, in the eye, it will be difficult for you to tell me which one was produced by real solving Navier-Stokes equations and the others by, uh, by the machine. And, uh, and you can also check that they are not the same, even though they look you know, similar, you can check by cosine distances that they, it gave you different solutions. And then you can ask, okay, what will it do to the statistics? So here I'm checking, for instance, the Kolmogorov scaling in 2D inverse cascade. And you can see that the numerical and the machine are doing pretty okay, both of them. And in fact, even the machine had a smaller error. That I don't know if it's a general story, but this raises a very important point to be understood. How much of the patch of the space of solutions do I need to give the machine in order for it to be able, be able for instance, to see all the rare events, to produce new rare events, because I need all of this in order to get to the higher moments. This is a question I don't know the answer to, but there is an approach here which uh, which has some uh, some uh, chance. I think I'm about to finish the time, so let me uh, stop by telling you a few challenges. I think getting to precision turbulence will help us a lot. That's clear because will help us to build a good understanding in model. Uh, I think that gravity, the whole information in the fractal structure of the horizon will be very, very useful for us. This, it's not just, originally I was thinking that maybe I'm just mapping a problem which is complicated to another problem which is complicated and so it doesn't matter. I, I think that random geometry can be valuable. Uh, and uh, I think that deep learning has a chance, has a chance to help us to, to learn some things about this distribution. There are other, many other things like implying all these things to other fields like superfluid turbulence, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, uh, let, me, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yaron, for exhaust. I mean, you covered so many topics and very interesting ones. So we are open for questions. Please. I uh, thank you very much for your talk. I enjoyed that. I have a, a, a very general question. Uh, I, I wonder if we can get a deep understanding, a deeper understanding of turbulence from uh, deep machine learning somehow. Okay, because I mean, it seems that we know how the computer, the computer knows how to solve the problem, but I would like to know how to solve the problem. Do you think that the, can, it, there can be a feedback from from uh, uh, the deep learning to deep understanding? Right, uh, so it's a good question. I think uh, what we know about machine learning today is by itself already pretty, pretty tricky. I mean, how did it reach this conclusion, that conclusion? So I think what we can gain in the beginning is perhaps it will help us to get, first of all, to the area of precision turbulence. And then we can look under the hood and try to understand how we did it. So this is like, I'll give you an example from chess, okay? So when computer, when the, the machines beat you in, uh, beat us on chess, so we say, who cares? I mean, it's a computer, it's much stronger than us. But that's not the important point. The important point is that it discovers new strategies that we never thought about before. For instance, it would sacrifice the queen first, something that we never do. And then like, you know, nine steps later, it will win. These are the things that I'm hoping it can tell us, not just tell us, uh, yes, okay, I can get for you solutions to Navier Stokes, but it will actually give us new ideas of thinking about the problem which we didn't think before. That's why we try to understand this so-called machine learning complexity. We try to understand how the machine, whether the machine views, I didn't explain exactly what the measure I was using. It's uh, some kind of dim effective dimension of, of PCA decomposition, but can it actually 
give us an idea of what is complex and what is not complex in turbulence. So I think the I think the answer to the, your question is yes. Uh, much like he told us all kinds of interesting things about, let's say, chess, which we never knew. Or, but yeah, but it will take a while. Yeah. I remember playing with these ideas of Liouville theory applied to turbulence and uh, found the analogy between uh, Liouville theory and Komagorov Obokov model. And I was um, doing that in the early 90s when that was discovered. But then what stopped me was a realization that um, Liouville theory corresponds to random surfaces, and random surfaces do not exist in three dimensions. They degenerate into branch polymers. There is a real internal problem with Liouville theory if it is applied to, um, you know, three dimensions. Uh, that's why I stopped this uh, attempt. And then later I realized that uh, you cannot postulate things in turbulence. You have to derive things from Navier-Stokes equation. And I couldn't find any way to derive uh, Liouville theory or anything um, like that, or any conformal theory from the Navier-Stokes equations, which even in absence of uh, viscosity are uh, uh, not scale invariant, and not conformally invariant because pressure violates locality, which is non-local thing. And velocity has invertility, has uh, our formula, which is not conformally invariant. So that's what stops me. I wonder well, how you overcame those problems. Right, so the crucial point, as you probably saw, is the fact that I understood that Kolmogorov scaling is a spontaneous symmetry breaking. That was the crucial point. And therefore, if it's a conform, if it's a, if it's a spontaneous symmetry breaking, there should, should be a Goldstone boson. And I identified that Goldstone boson. And then when I wrote the effective action of that Goldstone boson based on symmetries, that's how I discovered this higher dimensional Liouville. It's not the higher dimensional Liouville uh, action. That was the step. Now, uh, st uh, before that, I wouldn't know because I thought the random geometry has something to play, but there is nothing random. Second, you see that I'm not solving this. I'm solving. I'm not solving in in real space. I'm solving in the inertial range, right? The space, for instance, the inertial range in the usual is a ball. I'm solving it on the ball because when I say the point R, it's a separation of two points in space. For me, it's one point. So I'm not solving in space. I'm solving in the inertial range of space. I'm using the fact that there is spontaneous symmetry breaking. So I derive this Goldstone boson and that's how I get it. It's not a solution in real space. It's a solution in the inertia. It's an effective theory for the inertial range of scales. So if you think about the infinite Reynolds number limit, uh, you are really working on the ball where the radius of the ball is the infrared scale. So, so these are the things. Now, related to your other geometrical thing, it's actually by now a uh, know that you can discuss, th this is called the uniformization problem. There is a generalization of all of the Riemann curvature, Riemann scalar to something called Q curvature, it's conformally invariant. And the, the Liouville actions, what they do is they solve a uniformization problem. Do you have a, a, a manifold uh, with, that's conformally equivalent to a manifold with constant Q curvature? This is a well-known mathematical problem now in conformal geometry. So I think the, the, the conformal geometry part is actually the last thing I would worry about. Uh, what I would worry about is, is it true that this dilaton couples to the mean field K41 theory as a dilaton couples, uh, in, for instance, in 2D? Th that's an assumption. That's not derived from Navier-Stokes equations. Hi. Uh... Yaron, I have a question. Hi, this is Venta. How are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> good, good. Uh, this is a, a question uh, just because of my ignorance, but you showed the devil's staircase, right? Right. You said that uh, different uh, 
pieces of the staircase uh, are not uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, the, there is no similarity, right? Right, right. Okay, so you that's one statement and, and you call that intermittency, right? Right, right. Yet, uh, you know, when you discuss the KPC formula, the KPC modification of Kolmogorov formula, yes. uh, it's a single number actually from a quadratic equation. So I didn't understand this. Uh, there's just uh, the right, Kolmogorov right. Uh, exponent is simply just modified by some other dynamical reason. Right, so right. So what has so, it to do yeah. with this previous right. thing? Yeah, of right, right. So, so, so self-similar structures uh, have uh, one fractal dimension that determines the problem. What people observe is, is actually turbulence doesn't work like that. And people tried something called multifractal, namely many, many, many fractal dimensions. These exponents, this Xi, Xi2, Xi3, et cetera, there is infinite number of them. And they are in, the, in principle, you would say independent. What I actually uh, show you that actually, even though you have many, many different numbers, they come from a simple formula. Now, how do I know that there is intermittency? You can, for instance, check the four-point moment divided by the second moment squared. If there is no intermittency, the R will cancel. It will be just a constant. If there is an intermittency, you will see R dependence. And this formula, this KPZ, gives you this R dependence. So that's why I can calculate for me this intermittency value. And if you will plot a signal like that, you're going to see that indeed it's not self-similar. There is not one number that determines it. Okay. Any other question? Okay. If not, we can uh, stop this talk. Uh, Yaron, thank you very much. It was a great Thank talk. you very much. Thank you. Think before closing there's a discussion session so uh, what uh, we plan is uh, that we will just summarize in five minutes what has been presented then uh, luca will uh, handle uh, will moderate actually not handle will moderate the field theory part and i will i've been asked to moderate the turbulence part so we'll just keep it short so keep your questions and uh, uh, comments brief and then let's see how it goes so this is open-ended so let me just put the summary part. So can limited in time. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, the discussion uh, slide is there. No? It's, it's coming. Here. So uh, one information: the lunch is in the cafeteria, not here for today. And is there a tea, Raju, after this? Uh, is it, I'm just wondering. Huh? Okay, but the closing will be, I, I think, uh, by definitely over by 11. Uh, 11. So let it be there. If it, Okay, let, let's hope it lasts for one hour. <laughs> well, we'll limit to one hour. Okay. So uh, next slide, please. Next slide. I don't have it, but there's only four slides, so just. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so shall we keep the streaming on or recording on or uh, off? Keep it on, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. okay. So, uh, so I think uh, as far as I, the feedback I got from uh, many people, it has been a good conference with uh, various topics. Well, I also felt so, but uh, there will be some, of course, limitations. So in field theory, we covered lots of topics. Uh, area laws started with that. Then we had a uh, black hole and uh, hydrodynamic, HDTs, hydrodynamic turbulence. Uh, uh, field theorists uh, gave a, so I'm not gonna, of course, discuss what they presented. I'm just giving a, just what are the topics covered. Wave turbulence, uh, Falkovich, then chan Simon theory. A popular lecture was good for us. Uh, it kind of put turbulence in the high pedestal. Uh, KPZ, Burgers, Brashe, uh, D-dimensional turbulence I did, and uh, effective field theory and hyper, uh, SDT, uh, some active matter connection, uh, Andrew. And in turbulence part also, we had a lot of topics covered, uh, scaling laws, uh, area laws, uh, uh, IR, Samriddhi, I will basically, uh, I'm putting in scaling, huh? so I think he said more stuff, but I'm just bracketing him in that. Turbulent convection multiphase, uh, Schumacher, Rahul, uh, Amrish, and uh, Pirlikar. Superfluid, uh, we had very nice uh, discussions with Subata and Mishra. Uh, geophysical turbulence is only one. Oh, I'm sorry. I made a, <laughs> made a error. So, typing error, Minini. And uh, uh, AIML, uh, Luca, and we are presently owes, in fact, he gave very nice coverage of all these topics. Uh, plasma turbulence, Amita, and particles, Rama. I'm sorry, Pablo is just uh, typing. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. So uh, what I will do is uh, I will just leave it, uh, ask Luca to moderate this field theory part. And uh, let's keep the discussion kind of uh, brief and give your ideas what we missed and which direction we should take. Okay. I, I want to be, um, to make things very simple here. So this is a very brief uh, summary about things that we discussed. I think that the, the, the important questions that we should address here is what would be the conceptual technical insights that would benefit field theorists, turbulence experts based on the cooperative work with turbulence experts, field theorists. So this uh, relationship between two communities, I think it's a fundamental thing. And we should have our uh, minds open to these uh, 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 interactive uh, work. Yeah. So, all right. So we we saw here. Uh, okay, we 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 saw here. Uh, okay, the, the, the previous slide. We can. Okay, we saw here uh, nice connections between the uh, minimal surfaces that are of the work common in QCD in the problem of confinement and the, the, the phenomenology of turbulent circulation. Also very interesting connections uh, between black hole uh, horizon fluctuations, quantum gravity, and solutions of the nervous Stokes equation. So just to like throw some uh, uh, ideas here, I would like to open the mic to the audience. Uh, Sasha has already called for a word even before we started. So maybe Sasha, if you would like to uh, address comments here. Yeah. Uh, I need a screen. Very important news. I can show him. I think the list is your team. Is it? Let's do a discussion and then we can. So we can have a general discussion and then yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's part of the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let other people discuss. It's, it's okay. Will let us... yeah, yeah. So, 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 so,
made in the future. Uh, sometimes we think that uh, it's important to have some uh, relevant big breakthrough, right? Uh, that would trigger uh, the community. Uh, are we about to have a breakthrough or, I mean, just trying to do provocative questions here. I don't have any opinion, I just <laughs> like, Consolidated opinion about that, you know. Um, so uh, I would like to know what uh, a few theorists, string theorists, would like to hear from turbulent uh, people, and vice versa. For instance, you know, I, uh, we've seen this very nice connection about fluctuations uh, of black hole horizon uh, and various Stokes equations. Uh, we have heard that uh, quantum gravity can help turbulence, but the other way around would be possible as a way that I am asking. Okay, so uh, please uh, don't be shy, take the mic. <laughs> I feel like, uh, you know, you know. Can I ask a fresh, question? Freshman course, and no, nobody wants to do that. Can I ask a question? Who? Who's this oh. one? Who is this one? Yeah, okay, nice that you are there. Ah, yes. Uh, so I wanted to ask the experts. I mean, there are simpler models of, uh, of turbulence, like for instance, the shell model. Uh, I have a question whether, do you guys think that shell model actually really captures something interesting about the dynamics of navier stocks or it's actually totally off uh the reasons the reasons for for these questions is because by now i have pretty much better understanding of that model and its scaling exponents but i want to understand whether do you think that this has anything to do with real navier stocks it's a very nice question Okay. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, I mean, you know, it's a good starting point to build up some ideas. Um, its main virtue is that because of the logarithmic discretization of Fourier space, uh, you can cover many decades. Uh, but, you know, you can't really Fourier transform back to 3D space from that logarithmically discretized 1D case, 0D, whatever you like. So they have their uses, and you shouldn't push it too much. Also, I wouldn't push it too much uh, for things that require knowledge of the dissipation range. Furthermore, as you know, the, in most shell models, interactions are cut off uh, at next and next nearest neighbor shells. So strictly speaking, it does not have the sweeping effect. So, okay, I mean, you know, you want to have a first shot at some power law, try a shell model. But, okay, you must also realize its limitations. I don't know, Shambhriddhi might have more to say. But from your experience, Yes. Do you think, do you think the, the high moments, the asymptotics of the scaling exponents of shell model will have anything to do with the asymptotics of the scaling exponents of Navier stocks? I don't know. There is no theorem which says that. So yes, okay. you know, we can do the calculation, but uh, I can neither prove nor disprove that it has anything to do with the zeta p's for Navier stocks. I mean, that's the honest answer. Okay, but Shamridi might say more. Shamridi. Just, just two other points on this since you raised it. So one thing that we know a little more about shell models is the fact that there are more concrete, I mean, there are concrete theorems on the regularity of shell models. So to that extent, uh, there is a nice work which actually understands the questions of regularity in a shell model, uh, probably, you know, uh, you know, on, 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 a, on a more concrete level uh, uh, than, than, than in the Navier-Stokes-Euler. 
about the animal scaling exponents, so I just have a couple of points in addition to what uh, Rahul mentioned. So as far as we know, the exponents that shell models give for 3D Navier-Stokes, they seem to be entirely consistent with, uh, with, with what you get from uh, Navier-Stokes or experiments. Now, the, the place where I think uh, the best agreement, and there we are on more solid ground, and that's something which wasn't actually covered in this meeting at all, is the shell model for the passive scalar problem, for the Kreitman problem. Uh, and there, because in the Kreitman model itself, there is a closed form expression for the intermittency correction, exactly you know, not of the sort, but you know, in, in the same spirit that you uh, sort of uh, did in your talk. So in the Kreitman model, we know what these uh, anomalous exponents are. So there's certainly you know, shell models have been quite faithful in reproducing those exponents. So at the level of two-point functions, I think it's a reasonable start. I'm not sure whether shell models can capture the log normal nature of dissipation of Navier-Stokes or in experiments. And yeah, I think Rahul sort of mentioned that, that when you have to go to the dissipative scales, which might be the interesting ones, shell models might run into some difficulty. But on A, on regularity, on anomalous inertial range exponents, I, 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 I think one can trust one coming from the Kreitman side and the issue of regularity, which is largely settled, I think. Thank you. Let, let, let me sharpen the question. I think that at low moments, it shows intermittency. I, by the way, it's not the same intermittency as Navier-Stokes. It's actually stronger. I did, I did check the calculation, but... Um, what I'm interested in is trying to understand the asymptotics of, of uh, these exponents. And because they come from rare events, my suspicion is that in actually... In large, large orders, sorry. By asymptotics, you mean the, large orders? Yes, like uh, there is the higher mo high moments, like psi n for n very large. Right? The asymptotics of the ex scaling exponents. Right, the, let's say the hundredth, the millionth exponent. Okay, so I think that asymptotics is an interesting question because it's a different physics in different models, which I I, I would like to understand a little bit better. So let let me share with you my viewpoint. Because high moments they concentrate on rare events. My suspicion is that what happens in all these models is that the main contribution in the asymptotics comes from the regime of the velocities, which is near the boundary, namely near the boundary in size. I mean, the very, very, very high velocities. It's a very narrow regime, really close to the maximum velocity that is allowed by these equations. And I think the asymptotics is determined by that, but the passive scalar asymptotics is very different, right? Because it saturates to some constants. The, the shell, I think I know what it is. And Navier Stokes, I have no idea, but I was trying to understand whether there is something in the physics that we can say that will determine only the asymptotics, will differentiate, let's say, the shell model from, uh, uh, from uh, the passive scalar, from Navier Stokes. Do we have any, any intuition about that thing? That is uh, the thing that I'm... I don't have a good idea. I understand what controls the large exponents, but I don't have a good idea whether there is something in the physics of the different models that will tell will tell us that. For instance, the, the you know the passive scalar is solvable, so we know it. But even in the shell, you don't know it. You know it only for you can know it only from numerics. Not to mention, of course, other stocks. So maybe if I can sharpen this question, can we say something intelligent about the large n asymptotics? you know, from the physics of the problem somehow. Okay. Maybe I could um, answer that uh, partially. Uh, with respect to shell models, uh, the main reason why, from my perspective, one should be interested in shell models is if you can prove something that you could not prove from Navier-Stokes um, directly. Uh, now, so far as I know, we haven't been able to prove multifractality for shell models certainly not able to calculate all the exponents. 
uh, with respect to the asymptotic behavior, um, now it appears not only do the exponents for turbulence de depart from Kolmogorov 1941, but eventually they saturate. They saturate, I think Aaron, you were mentioning that in different words. Uh, that is, uh, the higher the uh, order of the moment, uh, the exponent does not increase in any monotonic way, but it will remain flat with respect to the order of the moment. This is what I think the best we have uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, simulations uh, suggests, simulations and experiments, actually. Um, I think you can uh, show this through some work that Victor Yakord and I did, which we published in Fusible Fluids, which, of course, you might not know of, which I will send you a copy of. But I think you can construct a kind of theory for the asymptotics for the Navier-Stokes. And it seems to suggest that the exponents will saturate. Whether that is true of shell models, I do not know. Actually, to the extent I know, they don't saturate. So I think there is a big difference in the asymptotic properties, as far well as I know. But then would you say that, uh, you know, shell effect formula will tell you that it will scale like uh, mm. n over 9 if you yeah. go to large n. Is this yeah. you saturation or this is you call... No, shell, uh, uh, shell effect model as well as the model that Charles Meneva and I constructed, they do not saturate. They actually keep uh, going um, monotonically up and up, but uh, at different rates from uh, Kolmograph 1941. So if the saturation point of view that I presented just now is true, um, there is a conditional thing before that. Uh, if it is true, then the Shelevic model and the model we proposed and maybe others uh, do not hold for asymptotically large uh, value of the exponent. But if I, I may that's, ask... Uh, that's the, the interesting part. part. The interesting part is the asymptotic, uh, asymptotic part, yeah. Right, but if I may ask, I mean, the passive scalar has a very different physics and it saturates, but it's not the same physics as Navier-Stokes. No, it is not. But even there, what uh -huh. happens is uh, it depends on uh, how effective the pressure fluctuations, which is really what makes it difficult for you to calculate the exponents, behave towards very large order moments. And you can make a very simple estimate of these things. And you can uh, you can uh, produce uh, expressions for it, and they suggest that eventually the dynamic exponents for, uh, for the Navier-Stokes do saturate. And experiments actually do suggest, in particular, the transverse exponents more readily saturate rather than the longitudinal, which itself opens up a number of other questions. But basically. I think um, we the latest that I can say is not only are there departures from Kolmograph 1941, but the departure is in the form of saturation. That is extreme uh, anomaly in some sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Mahendra, Hi. would you like to talk? Mahendra, would you can like I just add something really quick to this conversation? Luca, I'm here. Okay. Uh, just to quantify uh, saturation, uh, I think of it as zeta n or n going to zero. So it's a sublinear increase. So Yaron, even your estimate of root n saturates, you see, because it's one over square root of n. So, uh, but beyond that, uh, it's very tough to exactly quantify it further because you have some errors in the higher order moments. So I would think of saturation as zeta n over n going to zero. And for Kolmogorov, it's a constant. So this is a uh, very extreme form of intermittency as Srini was suggesting. I see, I see, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I thought uh, saturation means really constant. Okay, now I understand, thank you. saturate at all. Um, uh, zeta n or n tending to zero simply says that zeta n is going up with n uh, slower than n. That's all it means. But actually, there is a real saturation. The point that Karthik is making 
is that experiments are not entirely reliable or simulations for that matter, but you can uh, plot the behavior and uh, sort of in a, in, a, in a plot where the extrapolation is very straightforward and you can show that it, it really does saturate. I mean, okay, there are indications that it will saturate, let's put it that way. But uh, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I looked at the data and it looked to me that more than the 10th moment, people don't know it and saturation will be much, much later. So how do you see from the data, the saturation? For transverse exponents, uh, the saturation occurs much sooner than the 10th moment. For longitudinal, yes, you're right. And we don't really have any uh, strict experimental or numerical evidence. But the trend is what I just said. And if you take um, Lagrangian exponents, that is uh, following the particle trajectory, and the differential is between uh, two points in velocity um, separated by time rather than space, and those exponents do saturate uh, well below, well below uh, six or eight or something like that. They actually show the tendency already. I can send you some of those papers. Thank you. And you can but, form your own opinion. Thank you. But I'm still a little bit confused because I would have thought that if you have isotropy and homogeneity, the transverse exponents and the longitudinal should have the same anomalous scaling. Are you saying this is not the case? Empirically, at uh, the level that one measures, you know, um, they are in fact different. You should think of it as summation of two things, one of which is a leading order term and one of which is not. And eventually the behavior is governed by uh, the leading order term, uh, which it appears to you they are, very, they are different, but in fact, um, it's just a question of which one is the leading order exponent. Okay. Oh, actually, can I ask a question to the numerical experts? How, how close are we, for instance, to calculate the 20th moment? When will it take? Like a generation, two generations, one year? Artik would like to say something. Yeah. Uh, even the 12th and 14th order right now, there is a lot of error. Uh, I I would not like to put a number to the 20th order, but I think it's uh, given the simulations right now, I think it's hard to get a handle on them, especially if you want to look at say local slopes and things of order one, uh, it's really hard to go to higher order and be very um, sure with small error bars what's happening. So I'm, I'm really not sure I can, I can give you a better answer than this. But I have a technical question. When you do these calculations, what boundary conditions do you impose in the UV? Is it a phenomenological thing or can you actually really solve it from first principles when you are calculating these exponents? Sorry, I didn't get your question. Can you please repeat your question? Yes, my question is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand, of course, the exponents and also the accuracy, because, you know, if you even if you give the second exponent, the second exponent to an, you know, a huge accuracy, it will be sufficient to differentiate the different models in the literature. And the reason why I'm asking this question, is suppose I'm interested only in the second moment, but I want it to be very, very, very accurate. You need to impose boundary conditions when you solve these Navier-Stokes equations, like in the UV. Are these phenomenological boundary conditions? Uh, I mean, can we really get like, you know, I don't know, accuracy of 10th digit, but only for the second moment? I, I think you are talking about the grid resolution in the numerical experiments, right? No? Different it's, grid, it's grid resolution, but you have to say something about your UV, right? Your dissipation. Well, right? I mean, I think the UV is right. just decided by your de-aliasing cutoff in a pseudospectral code. Right. That's it. That's so, you know, you can have different variants, but basically beyond some K, K max, let us say, you set all modes to zero. 
So you are studying a Galerkin truncated version of the partial differential equation. Okay, so then my question will be the following. Can we get the second moment to a very, very high accuracy? Uh, probably Srini can, but I certainly Srini. can't. Uh, um, the, the kind of rule of thumb is, if you want to get an exponent to one decimal place accurately, you need about a decade of scaling. So if you want to think about 10 orders of uh, 10, 10 decimal place, you need something like 10 orders of magnitude scaling. I mean, this is a rule of thumb. This is not a, uh, a strict theory or anything like that, just based on experience having done this zillion times. So I think um, there is never going to be a, a situation where the second order scaling exponent will be prescribed to the, or found the same accuracy as let's say Boltzmann constant is known. Um, I think this is just not uh, possible for a number of reasons, aside from uh, the boundary conditions issue that you raised, which I think is extremely important. You just need a large, large scaling. And I don't see how it will ever happen. I mean, ever is not the right word. Maybe quantum computing will one day do it for you, for instance. But I don't really know. I, I don't think it is possible. In the so can I ask you a question about your intuition? By the way, if I'm interrupting too much, guys, let me know because I'm not there, so I don't have a feeling of what is happening. So uh, you know, uh, maybe we should proceed. The yeah, discussion is interesting. So Mahendra, you have another slide here. Yeah, so should, yeah. I just say a little bit about what I... This next slide, yeah, yeah. So... Uh, my personal feeling is that uh, some topics we, which we missed, I guess we should could do it in the next uh, set of uh, uh, workshop. A non-equilibrium field theory of different formalism, this formalism, uh, intermittency, higher order correlations, which we are discussing right now, and there were several talks, uh, and Sasha has one thing. So anisotropy and multi-variable fields. So we are, of course, discussing a lot about Neumann strokes, but I've been working on MHD or uh, like geophysical flows. Uh, the field theory with gravity on uh, is a very challenging and very interesting topic. I think in astronomy turbulence, we had nothing. I'm not sure if anybody can comment on it. Uh, uh, this field theory is uh, altogether a different uh, ball game, And uh, I think uh, these are my comments, which I thought I could put it here. here. Uh, any comments on this or? Okay, so I guess there's no comment. So we'll invite Sasa to. So Sasa has supposedly said he has a hot results coming in the night from the night. So let's see the hot results yes. and then we'll close it. Yeah. You didn't sleep well. You didn't sleep well. Yes, before I, while my computer is still talking. I just wanted to explain what uh, I'm going to talk about and why I request this time. Yesterday, there was a very elucidating talk by Srini about uh, uh, summarized experimental and theoretical, theoretical models and experimental data for decaying turbulence. And uh, what kind of conclusion was that there, is a, there are two regimes, one uh, is when the energy spectrum starts with k squared because that just want to find a total momentum. But if find moment, if total momentum is zero, then it starts with k fourth, and that corresponds to uh, square of the um, rotation um, rotation momentum. So uh, beginning of the energy spectrum in decaying turbulence is fixed by the pumping. But then basically, when you start decaying, uh, you have some dynamical part, which uh, was never solved. There were some assumptions in some models, Komagorov, Sansky, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe uh, uh, the time decay of energy is seven, uh, 10 sevenths. Then uh, Srini presented re results, uh, results uh, for um, the latest results for numerical simulations. And it looks like there is no consensus about the value of that decay index. It oscillates, it changes the whole um, histogram of results. But basically, they group around uh, 1.5. Now, uh, it that didn't match what I derived 
Yes, uh, two days ago, it was one over T squared, no exception. But then I realized something very important. I realized that I was considering idealized infinite system. My energy was infinite. My spectrum went all the way to infinity at small k. But in real life, of course, I have to cut it somewhere. And what is actually measured is integrated energy up to some point, which is called, uh, well, this transition point usually it is uh, uh, when the pumping ends, this k to the fourth ends, and then you start having decaying state. Okay, so let me show you the result. So I just took my uh, energy So how could I, uh, okay, I need, I don't need this thing, okay? Can you zoom? Um, I can zoom, I think. I can zoom uh, in. Is it better? Yes? Well, I could stop any moment once I show the result. But uh, I think there will be discussion because that's rather interesting. So the spectrum which I found was not uh, smooth. It is uh, like devil's staircase. There are steps, slanted, uh, tilted steps. And uh, that spectrum is kind of oscillating between minus one and minus two. So five thirds might be a rough approximation to that if you are uh, sure, you know, don't see fine details and interpret these jumps as a computational or simulational errors, you would interpret that as some average slope. But there is a more interesting thing which we could study, which uh, can be much, which our predictions are much more precise. And that is, um, and that is uh, the time decay of energy. So if you look at the energy, in the at small, uh, 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 you know, in the beginning, uh, it starts like either k squared or k to the fourth. If we choose k to the fourth, then we want to see, which is my case, uh, because I have no total momentum. Then uh, I could find, uh, here is my formula. I have this universal num number theory function h of k. And K is momentum, uh, wavelength times square root of nu t. So I have some very specific result for that. Uh, it is now not no longer one over t because there is a lower limit of this integral and that lower limit depends on time because uh, my variable is K times square root of nu t. So one, when you consider that, you could make computations and then you find out that you could compute uh, where is it? You could actually compute the thing which is uh, uh, measured, and this thing is logarithmic derivative of energy with respect to time. It, it called effective eta, uh, n of t, and it was observed in uh, numerical experiments that this eta is not really a constant. It is something which is changing with time. So here is exact answer for that thing in my theory. And this uh, H naught and H one are simple finite expressions made of uh, um, Euler torsions and other um, uh, functions of, of uh, number theory. So that's universal function. There is no fitting parameter. So that's what I obtained for this universal functions. It moves, uh, it jumps. Uh, as a function of time, time measured in a viscous scale, times times new k naught squared, k naught is the cutoff. Uh, and then you have the, the curve, which at small times uh, 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 is rather dense, and then at larger times it starts jumping more and more. And all these uh, uh, levels, it's like energy levels, they are calculable, they are universal numbers. Mm, and uh, uh, you could zoom in 
and uh, look into the uh, into the no, it's not visible, right? Uh, you could zoom in and look into the very small scale, uh, and it's now a very small scale between 1.114 and 1.13. So that's uh, these uh, discrete levels go all the way to to the left end. Of course, that has to stop somewhere uh, uh, because we don't have that much uh, time and that much resolution. But the point is that um, that this uh, theory gives very specific predictions for the observable thing, and it is, I would say, in good agreement with experiments uh, if you kind of take into consideration that in my theory, there is no one single index. It's a quantized, it's a quantum fractal, what I call its spectrum of indices is discrete. So I have discrete values of N of T. So for some time, it's this value. For another time, it's another value. They are very close. They Classically, they would be uh, around 1.501 1 or 1.502. Uh, not exactly 1.5. So this is what uh, comes out of equations. I just took the equations I presented on the previous slide, and then I uh, simply cut off the integral over, over wave vectors at some small k corresponding to switch between pumping and dissipation. So that's all I have to say. I would like to hear questions. Maybe somebody would like to object. I would love to hear that. Yeah, I want to. Uh... Yes. Um, it would be important if you can compute the um, the exponent for the length scale variation as a function of t, not just the exponent for the energy decay, which you have computed and plotted here, but if you also show what how the length scale grows, that is, you integrate omega omega um, uh, in uh, in x or whatever it will give you um, t to the power something. And I want to know what that power is and how it behaves as a function of time. Because that will give you an additional validation point if your theory is right uh, to, uh, to move you forward. Uh, let me answer. Uh, I have to have a microphone. So uh, omega, omega, and energy dissipations are related. What I did previously, before, I assumed infinite system, and then I integrated over spectrum uh, all the way to zero. If I cut off integrals over spectrum at k naught, of course, correlation function in coordinate space will also change, and it, it will be corresponding to this thing. They, uh, I mean, uh, it will have, uh, you know, in, in, in wavelength space, it's just what I showed you. Uh, in wavelength length space, it is uh, it is uh, this uh, spectrum, this one. So this spectrum is what I get uh, as a function of k. But uh, if I cut it off at finite k, if I don't go all the way to zero k, which means to infinity in the um, relation, then you will have this curve that can also be fitted and compared with experiment. It looks, you see, locally, it is k minus one because each uh, slanted uh, uh, step, each, each tilted step has slope minus one. But together they uh, form the curve which is close to minus two. So depending how you fit that curve, uh, if you in, if, in interpret these quantum jumps as statistical errors, you will get some indices between one and two. So uh, that's all I can say. So now that we have, uh, you know, qu quantum spectrum, uh, then we could try to fit data differently. Maybe we could observe these steps. Because what I'm trying to say is in my theory, there is no such thing as multifractal or fractal. There is no scaling because indices are quantized. And um, it is, uh, there is no single power-like behavior. There is no scale invariance. And nobody proved that there is scale invariance 
in turbulence. It was phenomenological assumption by Paris and Frisch borrowed from field theory, but never proved. So it indeed describes reality very well to some approximation, but maybe now with this record new large DNS, we could go deeper and see whether there indeed there is quantization. It would be very interesting if indeed the more precise simulations or maybe quantum computers, because quantum computers also are ideal for my model. Um, I'm sorry, model means uh, theory. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, uh, with new supercomputers or quantum computers, we would be able to see uh, zoom into all these multifractal scaling models and see that indices are not numbers, but rather spectrum. Thank That's you. what comes out from my solution. Thank you, Sasha, very much for your talk. I think this is a nice example of a, co of a collaboration interaction between turbulence people and uh, field theorists. It happened just the night before, I would say. Okay, so I think it's the moment to close the, the workshop and uh, uh, give some words about that. Would you like Srini to address some comments? Uh, okay, I just, so, so you want to say, so yeah. vote of thanks we should give to the ICS. Should I do it first or you can uh, you come inside? <laughs> um, I know that uh, Rajesh is not here, uh, but I want to thank uh, him as the director of this institute and uh, also the staff, uh, some are here, uh, who have really cooperated uh, with uh, the organizers uh, so well that the meeting can be regarded as a success. I appreciate that a lot. You know that it required a lot of, and you would guess that it required a lot of work. And I think it wouldn't have been possible without the real support that the, um, that ICPS uh, gave us. And there are some issues that I would uh, bring it to the management um, later on. There were issues that could be simplified and which would make the life of the organizers of conferences like this easier, but I will do that uh, privately with uh, Rajesh. I also want to say that as uh, organizers, the four of us, I'm not sure whether uh, Loga is here or not, but oh, there he is. Uh, we never had a disagreement, by the way, not even mild disagreement. We just worked uh, extremely well, and it was possible, I think, to some degree by the uh, goodwill that ICTS provided us. So I thank, um, uh, all the organizers, myself included. Oh, there he is. Okay. He just arrived a little bit uh, late. I was just thanking uh, the enormous support that you and uh, your center uh, provided us uh, for uh, uh, holding this meeting. And we appreciate that. And we will come back again maybe sometime later. I was also saying that uh, there are one or two things about which we will write to you as organizers uh, where I think uh, things could be done better. Um, I don't mean that you're not doing very well already, but one could do a little bit uh, better. So thank you again. I'm uh, really glad you came at the uh, right moment.